a game of chess that spans the globe. China seems to be winning. The U.S. doesn't even realize it's playing. At stake, the waters of the Pacific Ocean. Whoever controls them gains military power. China has been buying up islands in the region, paving the way for future military bases. Unlike news from the South China Sea and larger Indo-Pacific regions, those actions haven't been making headlines. Rather, the silent development is much closer to U.S. shores. In this special report, we look at what China's presence there means for the U.S. going forward and what can be done to even the playing field. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Is China launching an attack from behind America's defenses? That's what some are saying. Asia's czar Kirk Campbell recently hinted that China poses a, quote, strategic surprise in the Pacific. So what does that mean? Let's look at a map to see what's really being played out. News headlines proclaim the U.S. and its allies are holding joint naval drills in the South China Sea and Indo-Pacific region near something called the First Island Chain. Effectively, it's a chain of islands uh, that stretch from uh, Japan down to uh, Taiwan to the Philippines down to Indonesia and Malaysia. Grant Newsham, senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy, goes on to note why the chain is so important. And effectively, if you look at the map, it blocks off the Chinese People's Liberation Army, the Chinese military, when it's trying to get out into the Pacific. So it's really a defense line, and Taiwan is right in the middle of it. And obviously, if uh, the middle of your defense line falls, uh, that the other side has really free access into the Pacific. But that hasn't happened yet. So what the Americans are really thinking is to kind of defend along that first island chain. And that's sort of the front of America's defenses. This chain of islands blocks China's military from accessing the deep waters of the Pacific Ocean. Reaching those waters would allow China's nuclear-armed submarines to dive deep enough to avoid U.S. detection and be able to launch a surprise assault on American shores. Now, as Newsham points out, if there's a front to the defense line, there's a back. What the Chinese have done very cleverly over the last 20, 30 years, really, is to establish themselves in practically every island in the Pacific, to including American territories. China has got a, a presence, a foothold, in nearly every island in the Central Pacific, the South Pacific, the Southwest Pacific, and as far as the west coast of Latin America. So while America's uh, defending forward, China is popping up in the rear. To do it, Beijing has been racking up influence in what's known as the second island chain. Alex Gray, senior fellow of the American Foreign Policy Council, explains. So the second island chain uh, is basically Oceania, um, the islands that stretch through Guam, Micronesia, down through Solomon Islands um, and Vanuatu, down towards Australia and New Zealand. The importance of this second island chain goes back centuries. But let's just look at World War II. And these are the islands that Japan made a tremendous effort to militarize, to colonize, uh, to fortify, and that a tremendous amount of, of blood and treasure was expended by the Americans and our allies uh, to, to liberate these islands in World War II. Now, some might argue that's all in the past, but these islands also serve another purpose. Strategically, uh, they're so important because if you're thinking about with the United States military needing access to East Asia, whether the scenario is a hypothetical scenario involving Taiwan, a scenario involving Japan, a scenario involving the Korean Peninsula, we have to have the ability to supply our forces in the, in the region from the West Coast and from Hawaii, uh, primarily by ship. And in order to do that, we have to pass through the islands that comprise that second island chain. Now, judging by news headlines, it seems the U.S. has focused on the first island chain. But China's taking a different approach. 
China has expressed interest in military bases across that second island chain because we have to have unfettered access to get our, our troops, our ships, our aircraft, our supplies uh, through those, those islands. Cutting off that kind of access has been a military strategy stretching back through the ages. You know, we know that historically having that access is, is critical to being able to project power throughout the region uh, and also being able to deny access to your competitor. And Beijing seems to be brushing up on that history. Historically, if you take a map of where Japan had, Imperial Japan had its military bases before and during World War II, and you overlay that with where China has publicly expressed interest in gaining military access, it's almost the exact same location. Sometimes it is literally the exact same location. Uh, Manus Island in Papua New Guinea is one example where, where literally the Japanese had a base before and during World War II, and we know that China publicly attempted to get a base uh, before the U.S. and Australia were able to head that off. As for how critical that access is. Uh, I would say one of our highest strategic priorities in the Pacific since World War II, and, and even including now, is to ensure that those islands remain free and open for the U.S. and our allies to, to access uh, East Asia. But how did China get such a foothold? Starting with commercial presence, uh, getting Jap Chinese people into these islands, running small businesses, taking over, dominating the, the main industries, say the, the fishing industries, for example. And commercial presence and power equals political power, and particularly as the Chinese go to work. What's more, there are a number of ways to grab onto that political power. Here are a few of them. To watch today's full special report, click the link in the description down below. We are working with Epoch TV, and all full-length special reports are published there. Now let's turn to today's top stories. U.S. lawmakers from both sides of the aisle are unified on the China threat. Congress is gearing up to pass a bill this week meant to hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable. But one Republican lawmaker wants it to go a step further. Representative Steve Shabit of Ohio proposed sanctions to prevent forced organ harvesting from Falun Gong practitioners. Senator John Tester tells NTD he is expecting the bill to pass after a genuine bipartisan discussion on this critical issue. NTD's Melina Weiskup has more for us. The House this week is starting work on a new competition bill meant to boost American innovation and help us with global competitiveness, particularly competition with China. The Senate already passed their version of the bill, and now senators are pushing House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to move quickly to get it done. On Tuesday, Senator Raphael Warnock sent a letter to Speaker Pelosi, writing that the effort will increase resilience in America's supply chains while decreasing resilience on other countries. The House today getting started. I think the subject of today's hearing is such that we can move together in a, uh, a process that we haven't seen much lately. And it goes further than economic initiatives. It takes action to address human rights. It would impose sanctions for human rights abuses of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. But one Republican representative is pushing for more. To levying sanctions for involuntary organ harvesting from the Falun Gong. Falun Gong is a spiritual practice that has faced brutal persecution in China since 1999. And Shabit hopes this new bill will provide the occasion to consider stronger actions to hold the CCP accountable for its human rights atrocities. Tough policies like these ought to be included. The Competes bill also invests money into Hong Kong, 10 million to promote democracy. Unlike the Senate version of the bill, the Competes Act invests in climate change. Some Republicans say the bill isn't strong enough. They want more action, especially cracking down on Chinese Communist Party spies who are stealing intellectual property. Senator John Tester tells us that's an issue that needs to be addressed. I think it's very relevant. You think it should be in this bill? Uh, I, I am not a stickler for turf. Uh, if we can get it addressed, if it has to be addressed in this bill, go ahead and do it. 
The bill is expected to pass quickly in the Democrat controlled House and then will and then it will be reconciled with the Senate version. Democrats are really hoping this process will move quickly so that Biden will have an accomplishment to speak about at his State of the Union address come March 1st. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. Is China really about to invade Taiwan? Those fears may seem justified amid Beijing's threatening hints, fighter jet flyovers, and Ukraine-Russia tensions. But a former Chinese army official says the Communist Party's internal struggles are hindering its ability to take Taiwan by force. Russia's aggression towards Ukraine is making waves far from their shared border. That's as another area faces similar intimidations from an authoritarian neighbor. The island of Taiwan is preparing for a possible invasion from the Chinese Communist Party or CCP, but according to a formal Chinese military official, such fear is unnecessary. The CCP is unlikely to take advantage of this opportunity to invade Taiwan, especially at this time in 2022. Yao currently lives in the U.S. He says that lack of opportunity is all because of the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. And on top of that, Yao says Chinese leader Xi Jinping is busy focusing on the 20th Communist Party Congress this year. Yao adds that Xi doesn't want to pick a fight, nor does he want a possible Russia-Ukraine conflict to spark. A major altercation between them could impact China, too. The possibility of China waging war on Taiwan has persisted for years. But Yao adds that based on his knowledge, Beijing's senior military officers are no longer falling in line. One, there was no chance of winning the battle against Taiwan. If so, it would be the end of the CCP and the regime would lose control of China. Two, if we lose, not only will many people die, but China's military power will be greatly weakened. That's according to internal letters Yao received from China's army. The joint U.S. and Japan forces could destroy most of China's naval and air forces, which would be a huge loss. Secondly, how would a soldier who has lost a battle be viewed by society? As you can imagine, they would be very embarrassed. So there are a lot of rumors within the army, which have also spread to Xi Jinping's ears. But why is the Chinese military so worried? Yao says since 2018, the military has analyzed possible scenarios for war with the island. All of them lead to one conclusion. That is, the war cannot be won, especially with the U.S. and Japan getting involved. Still, Yao says Chinese leader Xi will still stick with the tough rhetoric about conquering Taiwan by force, but only to boost his chances of staying in power for another term. We'd also like to address a correction from our most recent episode. On Tuesday, we incorrectly stated the year 2027 will mark the Chinese Communist Party's 100th anniversary. That year represents the 100th anniversary of the Chinese military, known as the People's Liberation Army, or PLA. We regret the error. And now to another major part of Beijing's agenda, tackling the pandemic. A new wave of COVID-19 infections is striking Tianjin. It comes after the city partially lifted its lockdown over the weekend. It's the same city where Beijing first detected the Omicron variant. Tianjin is more than 80 miles from Beijing, China's capital, and home to this year's Winter Olympics. Chinese state media outlets say Tianjin reported 12 positive cases on Tuesday, five more than the day before. Due to the Chinese Communist regime's history of cover-ups, NTD cannot independently verify these numbers. The surge in reported cases comes on the second day of the Lunar New Year holiday and the Year of the Tiger. It's a time when people across Asia traditionally gather to celebrate with friends and family. Most of these positive cases are concentrated in two of the city's districts. There, authorities put strict controls in place, effective immediately. In one district, Hedong, provincial officials announced early Wednesday morning that certain residential buildings had been sealed shut. They also adjusted all local residents' digital health codes, part of China's contact tracing system. Now, all of them show red, meant to reflect a high potential of virus infection. The red codes bar residents from leaving their homes. A number of other buildings have also been labeled as controlled areas. Residents there are likewise forbidden to leave and are blocked from gathering. Their health codes now read orange, indicating a mid-level risk of infection. All residents in both areas must undergo regular virus testing. 
On top of the residential closures, a Hudong resident told the Epoch Times that officials shut down all nearby businesses. They said the shutdown is expected to last at least 10 days. Hebei district authorities took similar measures. The entire area and some surrounding areas are under lockdown. And one hotel there was evacuated. The district began a new round of virus tests at 7 a.m. on Wednesday. Massive testing for the greater population is also in progress, beginning that same morning. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.